Welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, brought to you by TheVirtualInstructor.com, featuring artists Matt Fussell and Ashley Hurst. And now, let's get sketchy. Hello there, everyone. Matt here with TheVirtualInstructor.com, and welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, where either myself or my good friend and fellow artist Ashley Hurst tries to create a drawing within a time frame, a defined time frame, usually 45 minutes. Tonight, we're going to be working with 45 minutes, and tonight, the duty of doing the sketch is on me. So I'll be working with pastels tonight, and I'll be working on pastel matte paper and I'm going to attempt to draw a wonderful red bell pepper. I'm excited to get into this one, and I hope you are too. But before we get into tonight's live broadcast, one of the things that we've been doing here as part of Getting Sketchy is we have been basically doing a countdown of our top five artists of all time. And Ashley and I have different opinions on this. We do have one artist that is on both of our list, and we're really not sure how we're going to handle that when we get to that artist because we're kind of featuring one artist per week. I've got an idea. Okay, wait, good. Ashley's got an idea. So I can't wait to hear that idea because I haven't heard it yet. But uh, that's what we're doing here. And tonight it's my turn to reveal my number four artist on the list. And that is Claude Monet. Uh, you'd have to be living under a rock not to know who Monet is, but... Monet is a French artist, or was a French artist and an Impressionist. In fact, the entire Impressionist movement was named after one of his paintings that included the word Impression in the title. He, of course, was obsessed with capturing light and would often paint the same scenes over and over again to capture different lighting effects in his paintings. Monet, of course, moved to a property that featured gardens, which became the subjects of many of his paintings and led him to a strong interest in the beauty of, a, of the manicured landscape. And as he became financially more successful, he would later purchase land that included a water meadow, and this site would eventually become the source for some of his most famous paintings of water lilies. So there it is. Number four on my list is Claude Monet. And... Uh, Ashley, of course, is going to be revealing his number three artist next week. Mm -hmm. um, but before we get into the drawing part of tonight's broadcast, I'd like to remind you that uh, Getting Sketchy is brought to you by TheVirtualInstructor.com. And we have a wonderful membership program over there that includes a variety of drawing and painting courses, which include videos and eBooks, weekly live lessons. In fact, after we're done with Getting Sketchy, we're going to head over to TheVirtualInstructor.com and do another broadcast where we're working on a pencil drawing, a realistic pencil drawing of one of my daughters. And I'll share with, share with you where we are in that process in just a few minutes. There's also weekly critiques as part of the Members Minute and a year-long curriculum for visual arts teachers. So there's lots to explore over there. There's a link in the description below this video if you want to check it out. Don't need to check it out right now because we're getting ready to go into a drawing exercise. But after the video, if you want to check out our program, you can. Everyone starts with a trial, a free trial for seven days. And uh, if you want to check out just free of, three of our course videos and eBooks for free, there's a link to do that below as well. And that'll give you an idea of what our membership program is all about. Um, oh, and we're always going to be featuring a product each week, um, an art product. And this week's art product is pastel matte paper by Claire Fontaine. That's the paper that I'm going to be working on to complete this uh, pastel drawing in just a minute. There is a link below this video. It is an affiliate link. It will send you over to Amazon. What that means is if you do purchase through that link, that means we make a small commission, but it's at no additional cost to you. So um, anyway, I think we're ready. We're, we're ready. Ready to switch over to the main camera. So we'll switch over to the main camera. We'll take a look at where we are so far in the live lesson process, and then we'll get into the drawing. Because... Things are about to get probably a little bit messy around here. They're going to get a little bit sketchy. <laughs> They're going to get sketchy for, for sure, but also maybe a little bit messy because I'm going to be working with pastels. This paper here is the pastel matte paper that I was talking about, and um, you can't really see it on the video, but it does have a little bit of a fine tooth associated with it. It's almost like a very, very fine grit sandpaper. Yeah, it's like 400 or 600 grit automotive sandpaper if you're familiar with that. 
Yeah, it's uh, very, 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 very thin. And people are saying that there's a little bit of feedback when you're talking there, Ashley. I saw so that. I'm going to uh, turn your mic down a little bit. Okay. And uh, hopefully, hopefully that takes this care is better of the feedback. And maybe you guys can let me know in the chat. <laughs> yeah, let us know if there's additional feedback when Ashley's talking. If I need to stop talking, just let me know. We we can't. We can hear the words coming out of our mouth, of course, but we can't hear what's happening on the broadcast. Uh, so we just assume that everything's working okay. And, uh, you know, all the. All the lights here on my dashboard look like they're working the way they're supposed to, so I assume they are. Um, anyway, this paper has a very fine tooth associated with it, which is really great for layering pastels. There is a limit to the amount of uh, pastel material that you can apply to the surface. If you are a really heavy layerer, this uh, surface might not be great for you, but if you do like more of a smoother appearance to your pastel drawings, you might really like this drawing because you get rid of any of the texture of the paper really quickly, and you'll see that in just a minute. Um, we are working with a photo reference here, and I'll go ahead and bring up that reference, and there it is. It's a very simple bell pepper. I should be able to, um, I, I, hopefully, I, I should be able to uh, accomplish this bell pepper in a short period of time. Um, and people are saying it sounds like he was playing the intro the when you intro, were talking. That's yeah. very strange because the sounds better now. Intro music like is the, not playing. The you know, the, intro was playing. Yeah, there's all kinds of weird things that happen with live broadcast, and uh, maybe that's one of the the weird things that ha happened there with uh, the live broadcast. Because it looks like to me that uh, everything's working fine here. We'll, we'll continue to to move on here. Um, anyway. It's a pretty simple uh, setup here. We should be able to accomplish it in the 45 minutes. I'm going to start things off by working with just a pastel pencil. And this is just a Carbothello uh, pastel pencil. It is a dark brown pencil. And then I have taken a few pastels out. Um, and I basically just chose a few pastels to represent a range of value. So value is the darkness or lightness of a color. So I've got this really dark red here. And then I've got a red that's a little bit darker than that. So this will be our darkest value for the pepper. And then we'll just work our way up to some of the lighter values here. Um, and then of course we've got that stem up there as well. So uh, I've brought out a, uh, a variety of different greens of different values. And of course, when we have a lighter value, I'm gonna use a lighter green. When we have a darker value, I'm gonna use a darker green. Um, some of the greens are a little bit cooler. This is a, a cooler green, it's a darker, cooler green. And this is a warmer, darker green. So I've got both warm and cool variations of both colors. You can see that this red is a little bit cooler and this red is a little bit warmer just to get a little bit of variety of uh, the actual, uh, the colors that are in there. So we don't wanna have the pepper be completely uh, cool red. You can see up there at the top of the outer rim of the pepper, I guess you could call it. Those reds are a little bit warmer, but down on the body or the middle part of the pepper, those reds are a little bit cooler. So we're going to have a little bit of a variety there in the color temperature as well. Um, I've limited the, the number of colors that I'm using here. It's still a good number of colors, but it's still limited to all of the pastels that I have, which would be completely overwhelming if I, I went that route to having all of my pastels out in front of me. So we're gonna start with a loose sketch, and uh, then after we've got that sketch on the surface, we'll start laying down blocks of color. And uh, I think we're ready to go here. So uh, do we have any questions or anything before we? Um, no, we've just got a lot of visitors from across the globe. So thank you guys for tuning in. So we've got uh, Christina Adams from Hawaii Island. Um, that's super. We've got um, Zoid HCR2 from Belize. How you doing there, Zoid? Uh, we've got um, Dorothy Harris says hello. So um, Judith is here. Great to, he great to see you here, Judith. All right, let's get started. I know why you picked this. It's your favorite color scheme, isn't it? Well, no, it's not my favorite color scheme. I'll go ahead and start the timer there, 45 minutes. I don't think it's going to take me 45 minutes to do this drawing, but um, we'll see here. I just want to make sure I don't go over here too far, so I'm going to kind of mm -hmm. mark that real quick. I haven't done this to this point. I want to keep the drawing inside of this this parameter here. Um, I do like the combination of uh, complementary colors, of course. Mm -hmm. and That's uh, what I was thinking. Yes. Uh, not necessarily specifically red and green, but I do like all complementary color scheme combinations. Uh, I would say blue and orange is probably my favorite combination of colors. I would have guessed by looking at the design <laughs> on virtualinstructor.com. Yeah, it's in the <laughs> logo. Uh, it's, I, I love, I love uh, orange and blue together. But, you know, any, 
any complementary color scheme is going to work pretty well to create some some nice pop and contrast in your imagery and it also helps to harmonize things as well so i'm just basically sketching out the outer contours of uh, the pepper here very loosely not worrying about making things too exact but i am trying to be uh, somewhat accurate and there is a little bit of a lean to the pepper i'm sure you can see that lean it's not directly straight up and down so i'm kind of drawing it at a diagonal it's got its own little gesture doesn't it it does and another way of course that you could start this drawing is by drawing a line right down the middle to indicate that gesture uh, this is a pretty simple simple object here so i don't really think that's necessary here but you can if you feel like you need to have a little bit more control all right now um, i'm going to go into where the stem is and it's not right up on the edge of course so we're going to drop down a little bit i'm just going to kind of draw a light ellipse there and then we see that one of the edges of the pepper overlaps it here so now i'm going to start putting in these contours and a lot of this upper edge this upper lip here is going to be uh, created by highlights you can kind of see those highlights but there is a little bit of a dark spot right there a little bit of a dark shadow And then right there over the oh, right. Now, did you choose a brown pencil because it's a warm object? So you choose like a, a warm neutral to start drawing with? Is that what you were thinking? Um, well, that definitely helps. That's for sure. Typically, in most of the pastel drawings that I do, if I'm going to start with a, a pencil drawing, uh, I will usually start with a warm neutral. Okay. So, I mean, that sounds a little bit strange, but uh, brown can be considered a neutral color and it's definitely warmer. Right. Um, I like to think of brown as warm neutral and gray as is, is the cool neutral. Yeah, it wouldn't make much sense to, to do this drawing with a blue pencil. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just, there's lots of things that you, there's lots of uh, colors that you could use, I think, but there are, are a few colors that you probably should avoid. <laughs> sure. I just think it's interesting <laughs> that you didn't just pick up the red pencil to begin with because it's a red object. Yeah, well, now that's something I could have done. There, there wouldn't have been anything wrong with that. Most okay. of these pencil lines are going to be uh, covered up anyway. Okay. okay, so now obviously I'm working on the stem. Now that I've got the basic uh, shape of the, the pepper in place, and I'm just going to pull the stem up, which is basically just a cylinder. And then up here where it starts to turn. And I want you to see how loose these lines are. A lot of people feel like you have to be, you know, super perfect with your initial sketch and you really don't. Now, one way that I can figure out if I've gone out far enough with this stem is to compare it to the edge of the pepper. You can see the edge of the peppers right there. And in the reference, it looks like it's pretty close to the edge. So mm -hmm. this is pretty close to where the, the stem needs to end. That's good advice. You know, use one thing you've already drawn to compare against everything else. And hopefully uh, your proportions and placement come together. Yeah, I kind of feel like the whole drawing process is basically a, a series of comparisons that you make. All right, All so right. this little hump happens right here, and then there's a little bit of a shadow right there. So I'm kind of just adding a few bits of information on the surface to uh, where, where I see highlight and where I see shadow, so that when I start adding the colors, a lot of that work has already been figured out for me. Remember, if you have any questions for Matt or myself, just put them in all caps and I'll be sure to see them. Um, quite a few have joined us uh, since we mentioned that. So I just wanted to reiterate um, how you guys doing. We've got Roxa Shah from London. Welcome Priscilla from Costa Rica. Uh, Vera from Brazil. Vicky from Australia. Iris from Australia. Fantastic. We're glad you guys are are joining us this morning, I suppose. It's, it's evening here. All right, so I feel pretty good about my initial sketch here, and I see that I've got 39 minutes left. So um, I was able to complete the sketch, I guess, in six minutes or so. So I've got plenty of time now to start laying down blocks of color with the pastel. So I'm gonna start with uh, just a basic kind of middle value here, because the bulk of the pepper 
is kind of this middle value. Of course, there's darker values and lighter values, but I'm gonna start here with this, and I'm just gonna start blocking in the color just like I would, I would do if I had a paintbrush. Now, this red is a little bit cooler, and you'll notice that when I'm putting it down on the surface, especially as it contrasts against this buttercup colored paper. That's the, that's the name of the color of the paper here. It's the name you made up for the paper, I'm sure. I did not make that name up. If I was making up the name of the color, it would not be buttercup. <laughs> Matt and I, I think we both have an aversion to um, cutesy nicknames for colors. I like to stick with using terms from the color wheel and, uh, and, and the four aspects of color when I talk about color. So if I were to describe that color, I would say it is a um, light yellow, <laughs> orange, light, pale, or light, dull, pale, or light, dull, yellow, orange. And this is why you can see Buttercup is probably a better choice. <laughs> <laughs> I think you probably could just call it light yellow ochre. Uh, I'll, I'll, that works for me. That's pretty close. I mean, it's pretty close to that. You know, it, I found it interesting. You said you were going to start with the middle tone, the mid tone. Yeah. And then there's lights and dark. So you're going to go back in a sec secondary stage and throw in the lights and throw in the darks. And that's actually a, a great painting process. I use that mindset sometimes when I paint um, I'll actually just kind of block everything in a very flat way with its mid-tone whatever color that might be and uh, and I didn't make that up there's a famous artist who is from is from England as a matter of fact his name was Walter Sickert he painted in the 1800s and he had a three easy steps to painting theory he would um, paint everything in general color, and then he would just throw in the shadows and then throw in the lights, and he was done. So three easy, three easy steps to painting, and he just thought about three distinct values and just kind of blended them together in the middle. So um, uh, a little bit of trivia. Does anyone out there know what Walter Sickert may be famous for besides being a painter? I'll wait a few minutes. I don't know that. All right, and while, uh, while, while we um, search the internet to find out, uh, what <laughs> defines a color cool and warm is a question. And I guess that may be specific to red because we think of red as a warm color. And you mentioned you've got cool reds and you've got warm reds. So could yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, but let me go back for just a minute. A lot of people refer to pastel drawings as pastel paintings because the thought mm -hmm. process is... Very, very similar. Um, pastels, of course, are more immediate. I didn't have to mix this color. It would be a primary color anyway, but um, I didn't have to mix it. I could just pick up a stick and put it on there. Um, and the layering process is very similar too. But mm -hmm. talking about warm and cool reds here, or warm and cool uh, primaries is really where it gets confusing. Um, you can see the red I have on the right looks a little bit more orangey. And the red I have on the left if you had to argue it, you would say it looks a little bit more purpley. And that's because this red, if we had to put all of the reds and yellows and blues on the color wheel, this red would be closer to purple. And this red would be closer to orange or yellow. So that means that this red is warmer than this red. Both of these colors are warm right. in the grand scheme that's of things. The, that's the distinction that confuses people. Yeah. Of course, they're warmer than blue. We're just talking about within the hue red, one is cooler than the other. Right. This this red just is warmer than this red. And this red is just cooler than this red, but they're both warm. Okay. We have a winner. H-A-S says that Walter Sickert is believed by some to have been Jack the Ripper. That is correct. Oh my so, gosh. One of my favorite artists, I like to think of him as not Jack the Ripper. Um, Not cool. I know. Didn't so. you have a controversial person you liked last week, too? <laughs> Probably. Are you talking about Corbet, my artist? Yeah, he what was, was it? Oh, yeah, he was... He uh, was a controversial um, figure in France at one time <laughs> for his right. political views. That's right. It That's was true. artist. Not to the level of maybe having the uh, alter ego of Jack the Ripper. Not the same. <laughs> Okay, so you can see I've switched over to a, a darker red. Um, and this is just pretty much a darker version of the red that we were using before. It has a little bit more of a, an earthier feel about it, but it's still just a darker red. Um, so now I'm going in and looking at these areas where I'm seeing shadows. And if, if I see a little bit of a shadow that's not quite as dark as this red, I'm still going to add it here because I'm only really working with, well, I guess four or five different values of, of red. 
Um, so that's a very limited range. And uh, so I can push the shadows in my drawing a little bit further. So I can kind of, uh, I guess, exaggerate it a little bit or fib it a little bit maybe. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was pirates. Um, thanks, Russ. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, my controversial figure last week was Blackbeard. So That's right. <laughs> you can see a theme developing here. Okay, so I'm, I'm bringing down some of the shadow color with a very light touch. I'm going to do a little bit of blending here with this uh, because I want a value that's not quite as dark as what I've added and not quite as light as the red I have in place, but I want it a little bit darker than the red I already have in place. We can see the shadow coming across here too. And um, just with the addition of this shadowed color, the form of the pepper is starting to make a little bit more sense there. With the addition of the flat, the red that we initially added, it was very flat. Now in this stage, you're you're just ignoring the light values, right? You're just looking for the I'm, darker I'm looking areas. for the I'm looking for specific areas where I can add this dark red. That's, okay. That's the only thing I'm looking for. I'm not worried about the light values. Mm -hmm. No, I'm worried about maybe accidentally putting this color in one of the light areas. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good point. This paper is fantastic for grabbing the pastel, but if you if you need to er erase or remove some, um, well, maybe we'll find out. But it doesn't look yeah, like Matt's it, making a lot of mistakes yet. So, Well, you don't necessarily need to remove the pastel since this is, approach is a little bit more like painting. You okay. just go over the top of it with an additional application. Um, you know, if I wanted to start over, I could. That's a great point. A way to think different. Think it like a painter instead of think like a drawer, you know. Okay, so now I've got some of these darker values in place. And another thing that's great about this paper that I'll point out is, you know, normally when you work with soft pastels, there's dust everywhere. But you'll notice there's not dust everywhere. Hmm. Um, and that's because this paper does grip. I think somebody said that maybe. It really does a great job of keeping the material in place. Now, that doesn't mean you can't make a great pepper on any paper that you're working on right now as well. That's true. All right, now I'm going to start warming things up a little bit. I'm going to use this warmer red here. Um, and you'll see the contrast. Hopefully, you'll see the contrast on the feed. It's going to be maybe a little bit subtle, but it's going to add a little bit more life to the drawing. And it's going to add a little bit of variety to it as well. And when you're creating your drawings and paintings, um, and this is key to composition as well, you, you kind of want to find a place where you can create variety but stay within the, the point where your, your drawing is, is harmonious. So it's kind of a... Uh, it's kind of a, a, what's, what am I trying to say here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it, it's kind of a, a, a tightrope act. That's not a, a good example. Act. A balancing act. That's there it. you go. Um, a balancing act between, um, you know, having variety, but also not having so much variety that you, you lose harmony and unity. That's a great point. Um, Variety and harmony are really opposite sides of the same coin, and you just kind of have to work between them. So, so far, we've only added middle values and dark values. And uh, when we start adding those light values, this is really going to feel three-dimensional, I hope. And speaking of lighter values, I think we're about ready to add them. Now, I'm not going to add any white to this. Well, I might add just a touch of white, but I'm going to try to avoid using as much white as possible. Now, I'm going to sw actually switch over to a pink pastel here. Um, again, this is just a lighter version of red. Mm, that's a great, you know, that's great. A lot of times we think of the, the highlights on a shiny object as, as being white because we think of highlights as white, but they're really not, are they? The highlights are really just the lightest value that you see um, now, there, there is maybe a spot of white here, but often the highlight is just the lightest value, and it may be um, like a medium light. So I'm using the side of the pastel to apply the material, and I'm not getting too fussy about it either, so... I'm just trying to think in terms of like brush strokes, of course. And now you'll notice that this pink is might look a little bit strange at first, 
but it'll turn out to be somewhat of a transition color. You'll you'll see when we go a little bit lighter with our highlights in just a minute. But I, I am, like it. I think that pink looks great on there. Yeah, thanks. But I am using the the uh, the pink to basically cover up all of the areas where I see the strongest highlights anyway. Even though that I'm going to add a little bit lighter value in some of these areas as well. So some you know I. Watching you work, it reminds me of painting wet in the wet with oil paint. You know, of course, these are totally dry, but uh, you're, you you kind of use the paper as a palette, and you have to, I guess what you're doing is putting down enough of the light so that when you mix it into what's underneath, you'll end up with the, your target color. Yeah, and there is a little bit of mixing that happens on the surface. If you, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sure you can see that yeah. and tell that. Um, but I can kind of force some of that mixing by just using my finger and blending it in blending it in uh, so you know you don't have to make exact perfect marks and there's a little bit of a slight highlight right here too all right so about uh, about 17 minutes has elapsed now we're deep into the into the sketch deep into the sketch uh, yeah i think uh I think 45 minutes will be plenty of time to, to get this one wrapped up here. I'm just softening up some of the transitions here. I want to be careful that I don't over blend. And this pastel matte paper kind of prevents that from happening to a certain degree. I'm also not worrying about the edges because I'm going to come back and address the edges when I do the background. I see, because you're going to go ahead and go closer to the reference with white in the background then? Yeah, with a light gray. That's okay. my plan. Uh, we do have a question from Anthony. Could you use turpentine to blend oil pastels? Uh, believe, I believe you can. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. it, is, you know, it is oil based. And um, I'll give you an, another tip. When you're finished, you can use floor wax to seal your oil pastels. I love oil pastels, but they do need to be protected, and we can't put them up against or behind glass, and they don't ever, they don't totally dry really ever, um, but protecting them under a harder, um, a harder wax like floor wax um, will will do, will do the trick. So now, a couple of layers of that. I didn't finished. know that, and I actually answered a members, the members minute video that comes out tomorrow was at, actually on fixing oil pastels. How about that? And I told them not to worry about fixing it. Well, you don't have to. You just have to play a little defense if anybody gets too close to it. Well, she had, right. Well, she had a, um, she had heard this very extensive process of fixing oil pastels oh. online and it seemed kind of a little bit dangerous because it included i mean dangerous to her art mm. <laughs> not, not dangerous to her health or anything but uh it it seemed like uh you know she had to put on a little bit of varnish and then a sealant several layers of it mm. and, and all kinds of junk and i couldn't imagine doing that to one of my oil pastel drawings and yeah i don't know if i'd want to use a varnish it seems a little bit harsh for something like that maybe a work on paper all right now i'm going to go a little bit lighter with my highlights this may look like a white but it's actually a very light pink so um, this might be as light as we go We'll see there's a couple of areas that still need a little bit of a stronger highlight. So we'll see about that. And I just want to point out, too, that, um, you know, looking at the feed where the photo is right next to my pepper, you can see my pepper is a little bit more skinnier than the pepper in the photo reference. And um, some people might really get obsessed over that when they're doing their own drawings and, uh, you know, want to start over a lot and... And those kind of things just hinder you and slow you down and are discouraging. And you got to keep in mind that nobody is going to see your reference that you're working from. Um, you know, we want to strive for, for being as accurate as possible, but don't get too worked up over making everything absolutely perfect. I see, and the reason I say that is because a lot of people just get obsessed with that. And it really hinders them as an artist. It's true. If if, all, if your only goal is 100% accurate proportions, just use a camera. But we're making, you know, we're making drawings. We're trying to, we're trying to filter the reference through our own mind and and focus on what we feel is is important to capture. And in this case, it's the that color and that sheen on the on the skin of the pepper. I think 
Peppers come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. They're still peppers. We've got a pretty good conversation going on in here. Um, Marina asks, I only have available at home hard pastels. Have never had the chance to use soft pastels yet. Do you think the results achieved are too different? And um, actually, Vicky's answered um, that, uh, that a lot of artists use the harder pastels first or early to kind of block in, like we talked about, looking for those mid-tones early, then start working with soft pastels on top. And that's a great way to work. If you're just sketching with hard pastels um, and you don't have any soft ones, that's fine too. I, I, I worked with just hard pastels called new pastels um, two weeks ago here on, on Getting Sketchy, and um, I love them. Yeah, it's 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 kind of hard to tell the difference once they're on the surface between a soft pastel and a hard pastel drawing. They're both they're all pastels, you know. Um, it's kind of like using a H pencil and a B pencil. Um, you know, the soft mm -hmm. pastels are going to be more like B pencils, and hopefully you can get that analogy. I'm, I'm sure everybody probably can, but yeah. that's that's kind of the difference between the two. They're still just pastels, and you know, Prismacolor makes uh, pencils called very thin. I might be pronouncing that incorrectly, but it's uh, it's what it sounds it looks like it sounds like. But anyway, those pencils are hard, where you know their uh, their uh, Premier pencils are soft. So that's kind of kind of the same thing. Um, and I've heard and also done done it the opposite, where I might have used um, pastel, uh, soft pastel, or even. Um, pan pastel initially and then layered soft pastel over the top and then eventually worked up to the harder pastels because the harder pastels are really great for details. And some of the some of the material that you'll find in pastel pencils is actually fairly hard too. I'm glad you mentioned that with, with regard to details. We've got another question in the chat. Why are pastels made flat and not pointed? Um, well, you can lay them down and cover large swaths of paper. Um, with the flat edge, but you can also think about all each of the four corners as a point and uh, and use a corner until it wears down and then turn the pastel in your hand and use another corner as a point. But um, like Matt mentioned, the new pastels are smaller sticks so that you might be able to work with them in a, in a maybe a more exacting fashion. And then there's pastel pencils. So there are pastels that come in a, that come pointed as well. So I would I would uh, I would use both. And you know how much variety you can get with a br a paintbrush? Well, the same's kind of true for a pastel stick. It's kind of if you think of it like a paintbrush, mm -hmm. then it makes sense that it's a little bit broader because you have a little bit you can turn it in different directions and get all different types of marks uh, and so on. Um, all right, so if I was going to if I was going to uh, you know if this was going to be a finished drawing, I'd probably continue with maybe some other colors in here. It might seem strange, but it kind of seems like there's maybe a little bit of yellow, maybe a little bit of green actually in the skin around either edge mm. where we're seeing some of that highlight, uh, at least on the iPad that I'm looking at. You might not be able to see that in the in the reference on your screen. But uh, anyway, but right now we've got a pretty good range of value. I just went in with a very dark red. This may look like a black, but it's not. It's a very dark red. So all of these are different varieties of reds. Now I'm going to go, before I go on the stem, I'm going to go back with that warmer red and just kind of add a little bit more variety and also soften the transition between some of these highlighted areas. We've got another technical question about working with, um, with pastel. And it is, how do you seal um, pastels? And uh, that's a great question. Um, we use a fixative of some sort. And I like to use, it's personal preference, I like to use the Grumbacher brand fixative. They're final fixative. But you can, the fixative comes in two types, workable and final. And you can use the workable fixative during your process to fix a, an underlayer so that you can put a, another layer on top. Like you might fix your hard pastel layer before moving on to soft pastel. But eventually you want to use a final or permanent fixative. And uh, the directions are pretty clear on the cans. Um, I usually give them a couple of coats from about 18 inches away in rows, making quick strokes back and forth. And this is a great benefit of both of us being on here because uh, those of, of you who uh, 
have followed any of the pastel courses that have know that I don't fix any of my drawings. And there's a re the reason why I don't is because the fixative um, kind of has the tendency to make your values a little bit darker. That's a great point. And, and you have to be real careful not to use too much or they'll stay darker. Well, yeah. I mean, even if you put on a light coat with some fixatives. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I've got a member's minute little experiment that I did and um, used a little bit of uh, the the uh, fixative over two different areas of pastel. And you can clearly see the difference in the values. Hmm. Um, and it's just... And everything does that. I mean, you've heard of, maybe you've heard of people using, um, what is it, hairspray? Yes, I, I used Hairsp hairspray back in the seventh grade because yeah. that's what my school had. Yeah, that, the hairspray does the same thing. Um, I haven't found a, and, you know, I was reading a post the other day about an artist who does some really large-scale pastel drawings, um, and he also does not use fixative and I, for the same reason. He said that the, it changes the color and the value. So you just just have to be careful with that. Uh, usually, Matt, um, people display their pastels um, framed behind glass, oh, right? Yeah. Like a watercolor. Oh, yeah. So that's the best way to protect it. Oh, definitely. Is, a, is an actual physical barrier. You just want to make sure that the pastel paper is matted and mounted in such a way that it's not in contact with the glass. Okay. Yeah, that solves it. Mm -hmm. Problem solved. Tina, I hope that answered your question about the change in the color of the pastels. Um, Zoid's got a question in all caps. What type of pencils do you guys recommend when drawing? Since I'm just a beginner and don't have any fancy pencil types like um, HB and those kinds of pencils, that's right. The HB pencil, you can think of it as, um, as just like your number two pencil. Number two is like an office supply designation and the... Um, pencils that have letters on them like B or H or HB, um, those are just a different way of classifying the level of darkness, but an HB is pretty much like a number two pencil. Yeah, if you have a if you have an HB pencil, or I mean, if you have a number two pencil, then you have one of those fancy HB pencils. That's right. Um, the brand, when you're ready to purchase pencils, I think that there's a number of brands out there that are really good. Um, I like Derwent Gra Graphic um, graphite pencils. The ones that Steeler makes are great too. I think they're, are they still called Lars Lumograph or something like that? The ones that Steeler makes? I'm not sure. The blue ones. And then Prismacolor oh, yeah, makes a line right. that uh, I think are called turquoise. You know, the turquoise pencils? Oh yeah. Those uh, are great pencils. And then there's Blackwing pencils, which are kind of all around pencils. So you don't have to buy a whole set. You can get away with just using one or two pencils. And uh, then there's the General's Layout pencils. There's lots of lots of really great quality uh, pencils out there to choose from. You know, I would say probably the the quality of pencils varies less than the quality of some other brand, uh, other types of art media, like probably oil paint, um, just because they're probably a little bit cheaper to manufacture anyway. Yeah, that's true. Um, and there's not a whole lot that can go wrong in the manufacturing process. That's to right. Probably change the quality. Okay, so uh, on the stem here, just like I did with the uh, body of the, the bell pepper, I just started with a kind of a base green. It's more of a yellow green. Now I'm going in with a cooler, darker green and kind of addressing some of those, those shapes of color that I see that are close to this color. And it's mm -hmm. really that simple. Um, and if you just kind of stay true to what you're seeing and try to mimic the shapes that you see, then you end up with a drawing that it, that resembles the subject that you're you're trying to capture. Here. You know, they're all just shapes, and they fit together like a puzzle, and sometimes they blend together, and that's why we don't notice the shape as much. Vicki points out that um, hairspray is what uh, she uses in her sketchbook, but it will yellow with age. Mm -hmm. um, that is true. That is true. Yep. Um, let's see, Nadia asks, what do you think about Faber-Castell's quality? I think they're great. I use, I use their pencils all the time. You can't go wrong there. Oh yeah, definitely. Like I said, there's a ton of brands out there that are really high quality. Now there was a question that passed a moment ago because, um, you're doing a wonderful job, um, getting your fingers in there, but what else can you use to blend, uh, dry pastel? Well, you can use a, um, a Q-tip. Q-tip kind of works. You mm -hmm. can use blending stumps, bl uh, blending tortillas. 
Um, the, I discourage people from using their finger to blend any type of graphite or anything like that, just because your finger is so broad and big. Yeah. And for whatever reason, the oils from your hands tend to mix with the graphite and it makes it really hard to erase. Um, so if you do need to go back and erase after you've blended an area, it's a little bit difficult to do that. But with pastels, for whatever reason, you don't really run into that issue. I think it's because you can you can cover over the top of pastels with additional applications relatively easily. Um, and I think that helps. But uh, I really think that your finger works remarkably well. Even with a blending stop or a blending stop or a blending tool or anything like that, you still can't really move the pastel material around that easily. Yeah, our fingers, um, you know, they have just this incredible sense of touch. And, and the pastels, um, you know, they can bend fully or just or just a little bit. So I agree with Matt. I, I try to keep my fingers off of and out of graphite drawings, but I don't mind getting them into the pastels any. Let's see, do you guys have any tips for digital art? I just started and I want to get into character design mostly. I don't think I have any specific tips for digital art beyond just talking about programs that you're using because um, I think I feel like drawing is is the same. Um, the benefit of digital art is that you can make changes faster or you can reverse um, things that you've done to go back to an earlier version. So I think digital art is is uh, is wonderful has a wonderful advantage in some ways, but uh, the process of drawing and and working with layers and like in the case of the pepper it still it still remains the same yeah i would suggest to to that person since they mentioned they want to do character design is uh, make sure that you are getting a lot of instruction in traditional drawing mm. because it is like ashley said it is the it, it's a different medium and that's really the only difference it's still a form of of drawing and you need a strong foundation there um so I would spend some time learning traditional drawing and painting techniques, and that will carry over into your digital art. You'll just find that the the creation, like Ashley said, of your art, it goes a lot quicker. But, you know, when Matt and I were um, starting out drawing, there weren't these wonderful programs that we have to use now. And um, when they when they came out, we loved them because we were, we were already pretty, you know, relatively skilled. We worked really hard. We weren't born that way, but uh, relatively skilled at drawing and uh and so I don't really think that there was, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, um, I didn't even use the digital media early because they couldn't replicate the traditional media as well. But in the last number of years, especially with uh, inexpensive programs like Procreate, the replication of pencil and pen marks is not bad. And and only, only, only when the digital media um, more mirrored traditional media did I even uh, really start to appreciate it. Okay, just to give you a quick update on what I'm doing here, I've gone through, just like I did on the body of the pepper, I've gone through <laughs> a variety of different greens, and I've also used a warmer green and a cooler green. There are some warmer areas and some cooler areas in this stem, warmer versions of green and cooler versions of green, and I've kind of now working my way up to some of the lighter values. But I'll go back, and you can see I'm making some adjustments in some of the darker values uh, to pull out some, some mid-tones. Pauline has a great question. This is about oil pastel again, different from what we're using here, just to just to clarify. What other mediums or media can you use with oil pastel successfully? I love that question because I like to use, I like to make acrylic paintings. And like we mentioned before, in the style of Walter Sickert, I like to just sort of block <laughs> in the major colors with acrylic and then use oil pastels to, um, to create gradation and add the lights and the darks. And so that's a kind of a mixed media process. And because the oil pastel is so sticky and you can really draw on anything with it, I think it's ideal to use um, not first, but on in later layers when you're working in uh, mixed media fashion. Yeah, like Ashley said, just make sure if you're, if you're mixing acrylics with oils or, or oil pastels, that's like mixing water-based media paint with oil paint. So make sure that you're water-based media goes down first mm -hmm. because once you apply any oil-based media, especially oil pastels, which will never dry, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, uh, oil, those oils aren't going to like that very much. Right. You can paint <laughs> over the oil pastel, but the paint's going to come off. 
that that reminds me of one one critique we had in college is, you know, everybody had these those kids that never went to class or whatever, and then they just show up with a painting. Um, Are you talking about me? No, I'm just no, 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 no. And this one guy did this, and his painting was literally dripping. Oh wow! Off the wall, and sure enough, he had painted over the top of oil paint with acrylic paint. Oh. <laughs> he probably thought it, it would dry faster. Falling off. Uh, it <laughs> didn't stay on at all. Um, all right, just adding some really light, stronger highlights with this uh, super light green here. Mm, yeah, that stem's looking good. So did you put... Thanks. I, I, I was probably busy talking. Did you put some red in that stem? I well, didn't, but I did okay. put a little bit of a warmer green. Maybe that's what right it is here. And right, that's what I, that's the area I was looking at. There is a, a red green. Have you heard of that before? I'm sure you have. You mean a red? You mean brown when you mix red and green? Together? Well, not completely <laughs> mixing. Interesting. Not full saturation mixture of red and green, or, or red, yeah, red and green. But you can. Make a green that leans a little bit more oh, I wanna see reddish. That. I want to see that. It's exciting. It makes a really natural green, and this green is actually pretty close to okay. what you get with a red green. So that's probably what you're kind seeing. Kind of a there, hooker's but, green, if you're familiar with Yeah, it's kind of like pigment. a, well, yeah, yeah a hooker's green is probably a little cooler. Okay. But the, a red green is kind of like, uh, it's kind of like what you expect if you put down burgundy, and then on top of that, you put a little bit of yellow green, like a middle, a, okay. like a middle to dark value. All right. I'm I'm ready to start defining the edges of uh, the pear, the pear, the bell pepper here. So, um, and I've been taking my time working real slow here, and I see I've got seven minutes yes. left. So I better pick up the pace here. I'm going to use a very light gray instead of a white, and this is kind of a cooler gray. And what that means is that uh, this gray would have more blue in it than brown. We can mix a black by combining blue and brown and of course gray is made by mixing black and white so if our black has more blue in it it's going to be a cooler gray that's produced and if our black has more brown in it it's going to be a warmer gray and this cooler gray will make the bell pepper stand out a little bit more because the colors for the most part are warmer colors um, Michelle has a question. Are, are pastels like oil pastels? And, she, and she, in that, um, can you fix mistakes afterwards, or are you just sort of stuck with your mistakes? Gosh, that's a toughie. I mean, you well, can fix mistakes in both. Yeah, well, oil pastels, it's definitely more difficult to fix mistakes, uh, I would say, directly on the surface. You can always take a scraping tool and scrape away oil pastel from the surface. I was going to mention that. I actually use a razor blade for that, the same kind of razor blade I use to clean my glass palette with and just scrape it back down to the paper. Now, your paper will be stained, whatever color you're scraping off, but at least you'll expose the paper and can mostly change the color. That's about the best you can do. And with soft pastels, you can go right over the top of whatever you've got down. Mm -hmm. But there is a limit, depending on the type of paper that you use. Like uh, this particular surface, although it's great for containing the pastel material, you can see how little dust is being released here. Um, and it really gives your, your image a nice sharp appearance compared to other pastel papers, which you, you know, with this marks, these marks that I'm making here, you would really see the texture of the paper. If I was working on Canson Mitant's paper, for example, it's just pure pastel is what it looks like. Yeah, it's really nice, but there is a limit to the number of layers that you can apply here. And once you reach that limit, you can't apply any more pastel. Mm -hmm. uh, it just won't, the tooth of the paper just won't accept it. The tooth is the texture, of course. And I'm just gonna kind of add back that little bit that I lost down there. And then I'm gonna put a little bit of cast shadow under there. So to add the cast shadow, I'm gonna start with a gray that's just slightly darker than my background. And actually, before I do this, I'm just gonna kind of add a little bit more of an angle to the edge. Here, uh, There's a number of questions coming in. Um, let's see. I'll start with, is it true that oil pastels, we're going to have to draw with some oil pastels soon because there's lots of questions about oh, oil yeah. pastels, and we yeah. both love oil pastels. Is it true they never dry? Yes, that is, that is true. They never totally dry. Um, the oils come in two types on the planet Earth, dryers and non-dryers. And oil, 
um, oil paint is made with drying oils like walnut oil, but more more commonly linseed oil. And then um, Judith, if you're if you're if you're watching, you'll notice that Matt's thrown in that shadow that you were wondering about. And then also, you know, the oil pastels are just made with a non-drying oil, kind of like plasticine that uh, that polymer-based clay that doesn't dry either, does it? It's a permanently malleable. Right, that clay painting behind me it is will never dry. But nobody can see the clay painting behind me except you. <laughs> I see it. It looks great. Uh, <laughs> Take my word for it. I promise. All is, right. So I've just dropped in a little bit of, oh, was there another question? Um, is there a specific type of paper you would recommend when using oil pastel? I like to use toned paper, a paper that has a color. At least I like to use relatively dark paper because the bright and light colors really jump off of it. But um, there's, like we said before, oil pastels are so sticky and you can draw on just about anything with them that uh, you're really not limited. Yeah, any paper that you can draw on with traditional soft pastels like we're doing here, they're going to be suitable for oil pastels too. You want to think of, you want to work on a paper that has some tooth, which is the texture. And mm -hmm. the more pronounced the tooth, the more layers of color that you can add. All right, so we need to go a little bit darker. That was just a little bit of a darker gray. Now I'm gonna go a little bit darker. So you can see I'm just building up the grays down here to create the shadows. These are not blacks. Black would totally destroy this drawing at this point. And just take yeah, it out. Yeah, black a would be bit. so much darker than the shadows that are very, not, what I love about the pepper is that the shadows are colorful. You know, they're not dull, so. Wouldn't want to introduce anything that would kind of compete with that. Melody asks, how did the microwave test turn out? The microwave test is still in, we're still in conversation. It hasn't turned out yet. And there we're, have, there have been conversations. I just don't know. We're, it's never going to go away. We're going to have to do, we're going to have to do a microwave <laughs> test. For the colored pencils, it's clear. We're, yeah. It's going to have to happen. We're going to have to put our lab coats on and, and we, do we, the microwave we're, test. We're, we're, we've got a plan. It's just coming up with the time to fit that in because that's going to take a while. If you tuned in to, if you were with us last week during the live lesson at the virtual instructor, there were actually a number of other suggestions as to ways that you can repair the... Uh, the filament inside of a colored pencil. And that included um, baking them in the oven on really low heat. I believe we had, um, was there something about um, hot water? Like, I can't remember. I'm going to have to go back and look at the chat. But there were four or five um, plausible ways to repair a pencil that you do not want to replace by spending $1. But I would just buy another, I think I would just buy another pencil. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's normally what I do. I just... But if you want, if you really, really are into that, or if your colored we'll, pencil set had a massive accident, you know, you dropped all two hundred and forty-four of them at the same time, that would be too expensive, maybe, to go out and replace at once. And and I would, that's when I would definitely employ <laughs> the microwave test. Then you're you're going to be spending a lot of time with your microwave. <laughs> all right, just putting some finishing touches on here. I could continue with this. I. You've got there, 44 seconds. Well, there, there could be more work done to the stem here and, and addressing some of the edges, but this is a sketch. You know, those few little details you've put in at the end on the skin, um, they, they work. I like that. Well, thanks. And, you know, one thing that really makes a difference is just framing out the subject. You yeah. know, when you're working on it and you, your pastel's going everywhere, once you put that that border around it, it makes a huge difference. So, Jeannie's... Uh, uh, Yes, Jeannie says that it looks great, Matt, and I'm going to have to agree. In fact, I like the oh, proportions thanks. of your pepper um, better than the reference, and so that's an example when we can deviate <laughs> from the reference actually just a little bit, and sometimes it's um, sometimes yeah. it, we make it our own. Yeah, I think that that is something important to point out, that uh, you have the opportunity to add more character in your drawing than yeah. what you see in a photo reference, and I went back and kind of carved that out a little bit, this edge a little bit more. And mm -hmm. even I would love to have it even be more angular. So I, I could go back into areas like this uh, edge up here and just cut a little bit in and just add a little bit more of a feeling of 
just being a little bit more interesting and more I mean, angular. It, feels, it actually looks more um, more peppery to me, like it's bulbous at the top a little bit. So I like yeah. that. So I, you have that ability as an artist, and of course you can, it's your subject. You can do anything that you want with it. And I could sit here and fiddle with this thing all night. Um, Bernie mentions <laughs> that... Um, well, you can't because we've got another show to do I know, I know. on the virtualinstructor.com. I hope to see you guys all there. Bernie yep. mentions that laying your colored pen your broken filament colored pencils in the sun for a few minutes might work. And uh, Bernie, I think that would be the very first one I would try because it's the lowest tech. That is the lowest tech. We'll just we'll just throw a few of those out in the yard and see what happens. But you know, the the thing I was thinking about, I was actually thinking about this on a run this morning. I was I was thinking about getting sketchy tonight, and I was actually thinking, I wonder if we're gonna have any questions about fixing colored pencils tonight. No, no, no lie. I well, was I actu you. actually thinking about it. It's cross it crosses my mind in the middle of the week, or th I know this is the middle <laughs> of the week. But on, on the weekend, it crosses my mind. Should I try to fix some colored pencils before next Wednesday? And I uh, probably should. Um, last, last Saturday was my mother's 65th birthday, so that's my excuse for not having given it a shot. But this Saturday may be the day. I was actually, and I don't even know where I was going with that train of thought, but I did have something to say, and it's completely lost oh, now, no. which is pretty normal. But I was thinking about the colored pencils and fixing the colored pencils this morning and uh, just wondered if someone was going to say something. Mm -hmm. Sure enough. We got, a, we got uh, one more question from yep. Michelle. Um, do pastels go bad? If so, for how long? I don't think so. No, and I can attest to that because there was a, this is going to sound awful, but there was a woman that passed away uh, that we knew in our school system, mm -hmm. and she left, she was a art hoarder, so she That's would right. buy materials, and she had an unbelievable amount of art materials. Brand when, new. Yeah, ne never opened um, when she passed away, and... Um, you know, since I was in the position I was in, I was able to give those art materials away. And what wasn't taken by teachers who came and, uh, you know, perused through that, I got to keep. And I got to keep several of her pastel sets. And all those pastels are still functional and working just fine. And if you so. don't use them, then whomever receives them after you pass away will probably still be able to use them. So... Yeah, so just keep passing them on. Yeah, just keep they're them all gone. Although I have since then um, bought my own a, a huge set. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Was, so I don't even use hers anymore. But yeah. they they did work. Mm -hmm. They do work, um, and they're still. I'm sure they're still. Yeah, functional. and if the pastels are high quality. They're made of pure <laughs> pigment, so that pigment's never going to change. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, is that it? Is there anything else? Uh, is your last chance? Last chance to ask any questions. We've got, well, it's time to, time think, to switch yeah, over. Yeah, I think we're going to have to take off, but um, thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks for the wonderful comments. All right. So thanks for sticking around for the last hour. If you did, I hope you enjoyed it. I definitely enjoyed it. Um, pretty happy with, with my sketch. Um, and if you drew along with me, I hope you are too. Um, and... Just a reminder, we're going to go over to the virtual instructor in 30 minutes from now and continue on with that pencil drawing. So I've got to shift my focus from more of a painting focus that I've been into more of a drawing focus as we work with the graphite. All right. Uh, well, I hope you guys have a wonderful week. We're going to do this again next week. We're going through season. This is season two of Getting Sketchy. Uh, I think we're going to run through about 12 or 13 episodes before we uh, call this season done. So, um, we're going to have episode, what was this, episode four? I think we're on, I think we're this on five. Four. This yeah, is so episode. Next five. week will be five. Okay, yeah, next week is five. That's right, my I think third so. artist that yeah. will make five. So next week, Ashley will be drawing, actually, and mm -hmm. Ashley will be revealing his number three artist on the list, and we'll see you then. If you want to, if you want a reminder of this, if you sign up for the three free course videos and eBooks below this video, then you'll be on our newsletter list, and I send out a reminder every Wednesday with a link to this video. So if you're just coming across this on YouTube and you want a reminder, plus a bunch of free art lessons, I send a bunch of free art lessons to you as well, then uh, just sign up below by clicking on that link to the three free course videos and eBooks. All right, with that, uh, I think we're going to go ahead and sign out for this evening. Uh, good night, everybody.